And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. The the head of the the head of Kibble's Tasty Homebrew, and the creator of the upcoming compendium of craft and creation, the one and only Mr. Kibbles himself. How you doing today, man? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on, and I look forward to talking about it. Mm -hmm. So, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings here in the temple. So. Talk to me about your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? So I go pretty far back with role-playing games, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, as far as making stuff for them, less far back. I've been probably making things for, the, uh, for them about three years. But I've played a fair number of various role-playing games. Um, I mean, mostly previous iterations of D&D, &D, but I've dabbled in... A few different systems. Mm -hmm. I think D and D is sort of the one that tend to stick with me. Um, but really, I've also played a lot more in the last handful of years than in the many years previous to that. Um, I would say even as late as the, the current edition is when the only one where I really considered uh, uh, the amount of, the amount of time I throw into it now. Uh, I guess that's where I went from, you know, more of a dabbler, reading books and occasionally running games that would go on for, you know, months here and there, but with long breaks between them. Um, but 5th edition is probably the one that I've played the most already, which means a lot, lot of hours over the uh, years it's been out. Yeah. Now, I've... Obviously, the obviously the big claim to fame is the numerous um, homebrews that you've put up on your site, and I'm curious if, for if um even in your early days you were a heavy house ruler, or if this was a, or this was just born of a more recent trend. Uh, no, pretty much from the start, I would say that I have a tendency to tinker with things. I think uh, 5e kind of was again the place where that got out of control. Because both, it's much easier to tinker with. If you're familiar, I mean, I'm sure most people here are somewhat familiar with something like Pathfinder or 3.5. They're both systems where making a monster or a you know piece of content for it, you can certainly do it. But there's a lot more considerations to make when you're um, tinker setting out to make a you know a monster. If you want to make something in Pathfinder or 3.5. Um, you have to spend a lot more time looking into, uh, you know, the, the, the various details of it. Um, building something out for those systems just takes a lot longer. So the tweaks mm -hmm. tend to be smaller. Mm -hmm. um, and then you couple that with the fact that there was just such a huge wealth of content compared to uh, what you see in 5e. Uh, and there, the need to tinker has gone up drastically. Yeah. So it's both easier to get content that uh, works on a basic level. Uh, this is, becomes less true when you're making something to publish, as there's more and more considerations to do. Like, if mm -hmm. you want to drop a special giant spider into 5e, most fairly experienced DMs could just do that. <laughs> you know, they you can estimate the hit points and proficiency and things pretty much on the fly. Mm -hmm. Where if you want to do that in... Uh, Pathfinder or 4E or 3.5 or any of those older editions, um, the, the, there was a lot more considerations without your bounded accuracies without uh, and with a lot more kind of detailed features that had more uh, detailed interactions due to the fact that they would try to make monsters more uh, a cohesive system. Mm -hmm. But in the same way, in doing that, you had to know that cohesive system a lot better to tinker with things. Um, and the same thing was true with uh, player options, as they were a lot less self-contained. Um, with, you know, literally hundreds of feats out there, there was a lot more considerations to tackle. Yeah. I think you saw that, anyone familiar with various third-party options or homebrew for 
those systems know that they even the even the pros from back then would make some stuff that was uh variable in power levels to be certain traps <laughs> i um I mainly blame Monty Cook for that. <laughs> There's a, I, I think there's just a lot of design water that's gone under the bridge between mm -hmm. the versions. Yeah. Um, there were definitely things that were admirable, admirable about those old versions, partially from nostalgia. But um, I also think that the fifth edition system is way more uh, streamlined and friendly to adding new modular pieces in. It's mm -hmm. kind of a homebrewer's paradise in that way. Where once you know the underlying framework, um, it's a combination of being able to extend that much more easily and uh, in a way that plays nicer with everything else, as well as there's just so much unexplored territory despite its popularity. I funny thing of the, the the thing I find funny when it comes to when it comes to the whole when it comes to the popularity thing is. Um, I can't help but I can't help but be cons I can't help but wonder if there is a bit of a bit of a return of the bubble from the 2000s at play. Not in the, not in the same vein per se, but more in the fact that there's almost two different there's almost two different games going on when it comes to the kind of game that a lot of people who are playing the third party stuff are playing versus the people who are just going vanilla only. I think that. It's more of a progression that almost everyone starts with the base content. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually would recommend that. I mean, if, if for people playing their first game, I would say generally you just need the player's handbook. Um, but the other part about 5th edition is that its release cycle has been very slow. So I think you've seen more and more uh, stuff pop up that is unofficial or, you know, being provided by people that have played since the start. And that's kind of where I come from in this, that mm -hmm. I didn't set out to start making classes because I wanted to share them with the internet. Uh, that's just sort of the thing that happened when I started making classes that I wanted to use. Um, when I started with the Inventor, for example, it wasn't my necessary intention to make a brand new class. I just wanted to have artificers in my game. And that was prior to that being an option. So I started taking the various things that existed, like the first try they put out in the Unearthed Arcana, mm -hmm. and adapting that into a class I wanted to use. So I think that's sort of where you see the tree coming from, where there's kind of the base uh, trunk, where everyone starts from the vanilla side of the game. And then you see people start to branch out from there, as almost invariably, people will want more options over time. Um, and because there's so many more people joining the hobby, I think almost everyone's at a different point along that kind of path. And I think there is a serious worry that people coming in now, <laughs> there's so much new stuff in third party options. Um, they can be difficult to decide what you want to include and where, mm -hmm. uh, especially when a lot of the influences people get are from watching various let's plays and things that might have their own versions of homebrew. So some people will start with kind of a leap into that. Um, but I, I, I think it isn't too much of a problem um, in what I've seen so far, at least, because uh, there, there's a lot of various kind of paths you can follow in that, and pretty easy to pick and choose for a DM what level of engagement you wanna you want to make as far as including external content. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I'm a bit biased in that because I make external content. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that that's one of the helpful things about systems like mine, where once you grab something from my general you know, ecosystem, you can have a fairly high confidence about the sort of thing you're going to get. And I'm not going to pretend that what I make is for everyone that plays 5e. Uh, but I think once people start using some of my content, they'll have a pretty good idea if the rest of my content is kind of fits their style of play. Mm -hmm. Now, when it now when it comes to the two um the two big and the two big entries in the compendium. I did want to ask I did want to ask on that the um Scion and the Inventor obviously. Now, with the Scion 
psionic classes and or psychic classes, whichever you'd prefer, have always been a very scub um, debate debate about what debate about whether or not they un, whether or not they unbalance the game or not. Um, what when it comes to the when it comes to your take on the scion, what what were what did you draw upon and what did you want to avoid from previous interpretations of psychics? So I often view that I don't port things directly from past editions. I think people that read my stuff can obviously see that I have certain affections for things from past, from mm -hmm. the past, here and there. But I'm not necessarily trying to port two e three three point five psionics or anything like that to in making my five e scion. Uh, for a few different reasons. Um, I'm definitely drawing on the things that those scions could do in the character concept kind of phase. In that I want people that played characters back then to have some ability to make a character that has similar themes in 5th edition. Mm -hmm. But there's ultimately relatively little direct mechanics brought forward from those kind of games uh, for a few different reasons. Uh, one of them being just that the kind of cultural zeitgeist of what a scion is has definitely morphed over time. Um, a lot of people want to bring in various more pop cultural ideas of uh, special powers uh, into their psionics. It's almost, it's not quite like a superhero, but people are very influenced by stuff like that. So when you when you want to offer telekinesis, you want to make sure that it can do what someone that's playing the first this this where this is their first edition of the game would say. Yeah, that makes sense. That someone with mind powers could do that thing. Um. So, I will say that the psionics of older editions were very esoteric, and I've wanted to keep some aspects of that esoteric. Uh, theme to them, but much less to their mechanics. I want them to play much nicer with the rules of the game. Um, now, I don't entirely merge them with magic, mm -hmm. though I do have some degree of psionic magic transparency, as it was called in previous editions, um, where they can interact to some extent. But it is still a separate power, a more internal power, a more character-based power than something drawn from you know the magical weave. Um, so it's kind of a combination of those. Also, I was obviously influenced somewhat by the Unearthed Arcana Mystic. Um, that had a great deal of problems in it that I think have been discussed online at length. Mm -hmm. um, but it also represented uh, a, a version of the legacy of psionics brought forward to 5e that I think uh, was, you know, it, 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 it had a little bit too much of a scattergun approach to how it wanted to do that. So I merged some ideas from that, some ideas from the past editions, as well as a lot of um, core template features from 5e classes. So my goal was to take the various themes of psionics from all these different sources, from, you know, modern pop culture, from unorthodox animistic, and from previous editions, psionics, Make sure I'm including all of the kind of options people would expect from that, but then build a much more 5e kind of class out of that. So what I did is kind of made a checklist of the things that I needed a 5e, I needed psionics to have, and then I sourced the template mechanics for that from how would 5e do that. Mm -hmm. So like I knew I wanted a point system, right, instead of spell slots or something like that, because... Mm -hmm. I don't think spell slots are a great fit for a psionics, even if they mechanically could work, just because they're called spell slots. I mean, you can only divorce the theme and mechanics so much, and that's where the limits of reflavoring come in. So you, I could call them psionic slots, but everyone would just call them spell slots because that's what they would be. So I knew I wanted a point system that I could call something like psi points or power points or something like that. I ended up going with psi points, but... Um, so, I, I, you know, you obviously turn to where do those exist in 5e already. Um, there's the spell point variant, though it has some issues, and mm -hmm. not everyone loves the spell point variant. It's much more complicated than certain aspects of 5e. 
and definitely difficult to balance in a full caster sense. The other obvious point, which I think people have seen my Scion can see that I drew quite a bit from, is the Warlock and the Monk. Um, the Warlock in the sense of a more compressed power system that refreshes much faster, but then has much higher base powers than a full caster. Um, and the Monk, obviously, being a perfectly functioning point system in 5e already. And for those familiar with, like, 4e, we'll know that Monks were already considered a psionic class there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I... That's one of the big influences of to how I introduce people to the fact that their game might already have psionics, right? If you already have Monks, you already have this special internal kind of power that is essentially psionic. Um... Perhaps key is different than psionics in your world. Perhaps it's not. But it's the same kind of branch away from something that's not quite traditional wizard magic or divine magic. Um, so that's another influence for uh, my scion. And I think that that's also a traditional influence for scions. I mean, if you look at the soul knife and the immortal, they do have a lot of overlap with monks. And that's actually how I went with the soul knife as it being a monk subclass. Mm -hmm. um, as it's all been about agility and focus and the singular application of your psionic powers. Yep. Now, when it comes to the other ha when it comes to the other half, the inventor. Now, obvious obviously by this point, um, with the with the advent of the e of the Eberron source book, um, the uh, the um, Artificer has already made an appearance in Five E Core. But what, where, where would you say that the inventor would be similar to the artificer, and where would you say it would differ? So, uh, if we look at the scion, just to to mm -hmm. give context, the scion was one where I very deliberately went out to make a class. Uh, when I made the artificer, people were like, "This is great, we love it. Uh, we'd like, are you going to make psionics?" Um, and so, while well, I didn't immediately go out and make psionics, eventually that's why I made the scion, is that people were asking for a scion class. So I created it very intentionally. I say this to kind of contrast it to my alternate artificer and my inventor, uh, which I didn't really set out to make a brand new class with it. Um, what happened there was that in the a couple years back now, um, uh, Wizards of the Coast released a artificer in Unearthed Arcana. It had a cannon smith and something like, and uh, I think alchemist. Um, and it, it sparked a lot of people's imaginations, but it was largely unplayable. I mean, I wouldn't say it was, it wasn't really that, uh, that's probably too strong a term, but it, uh, I mean, it was very much play test content. Um, and then it just didn't move anywhere for a while. Uh, so I decided that I was going to go in and, for my games, essentially, kind of revamp it, apply a lot of the things that I think most people that looked at it thought that it obviously needed. Um, the 6th level ability obviously had some issues. There was some scaling things. There was a one-third caster back then, which didn't fit in real well. So there's just a lot of things about it that kind of needed to be brushed up. And I think that's where the first version of My Artificer really comes from. Um, it's obviously diverged completely into pretty much its own thing by now, mm -hmm. where the, you can still see some of the roots of the things that I wanted to enable from that, the, from that content, um, such as the Thundersmith, which has its, you know, thunderous cannons and things like that, mm -hmm. that, um, that the, the things that really spark people's imaginations about that, I wanted to keep those in. Um, and I wasn't really sure that when Wizards of the Coast made their next version of the Artificer, I wasn't sure I was going to keep going with mine. Because um, I assumed it would be much more similar to what they started with. And that my re my refined version or, or refurbished version was just sort of something to tie people like me over until, you know, another version existed. Mm -hmm. But when they continued with it, they didn't ended up going in quite a bit of a different direction with it. Um, I actually put a poll out to my Patreon patrons. That was very early on my Patreon. I had just a handful of them back then. Yeah, what, what do you guys want me to do? Uh, do you want me to kind of pivot to making stuff for the new uh, Eberron Artificer? Or do you want me just to spin off my uh, updates into a completely new class? 
And 100% of them voted to just spin off my updates into a completely new class. So that is when we really had a split from it being the alternate artificer to what's now going to be the inventor. I think that's the real genesis of the inventor class rather than the legacy title that it has, the alternate artificer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I ditched some of the various baggage from the origins of it, things that I'd kept around just to make it so it could merge back into what I assumed would be the future version of their class. But seeing that their class was going to be something entirely different, um, I just kind of ran on my own with it from that point. I went all in on, I went pretty much from the start, I was very much into the upgrade system of my artificer. And I think if we want to talk about where they branch, that's probably the big difference is their version is, I, I mean, their version is a solid class. I'm not going to complain about their version. Uh, I can definitely see people playing that. Um, but it has a somewhat different vision of what an artificer is. I think it exists to make various characters um, from Eberron or from settings like Eberron into characters you can play in the game. Um, but it doesn't leave nearly as much room for a toolbox of creation open. Uh, I knew that I couldn't make an artificer like older editions where they just open up the DMG magic items and make their shopping list um because 5e just doesn't work uh quite that same power level and uh it's a little bit too easy to break that open and i mean you kind of see some of those problems with the ebron one where <laughs> it's not out for more than a week and people are making bag of folding bombs um the, the the dmg magic items just have a certain assumption that the dm has some some degree of uh control over that we can talk more about that when we get to crafting. Mm -hmm. um, but with my artificer, one of the core things I wanted to do was to make sure all of your upgrades are not things from the DMG because that allows you to uh, run it in games with variable levels of magic item commonality. Um, you're not going to see overlaps of your class features just because you got cool loot because all of the things you are building are unique to your class, more or less. Um, it does have some sort of enhanced cap uh, capacity with magic items, but its magic items are, you know, contained to its class. It has, you know, hundreds of upgrades that are all things that relate to its core inventions. There's no magic item in the game that's a thunder cannon, for example. The thunder cannon is an artificer's core invention that they then apply all of their know-how to making a customized thunder cannon that is unique to that artificer that can do a bunch of cool stuff that that player wants to do with that character. And that's sort of the theme of each subclass. Each of them have a somewhat contained field of expertise that you can occasionally branch out of. That's one of the main features of it called uh, cross-disciplinary knowledge, where you can grab one thing from somewhere else, somewhere along the way. But um, most of them have a core focus. You know, the Thundersmith has its Thunder Cannon, the Warsmith has its uh, War Plight, which is kind of magical iron, fantasy Iron Man-ish armor. Mm -hmm. um, the Golem Smith throws all of its inventions into making the perfect Golem, but then leaves the Golem Smith themselves as, you know, just the designer of the Golem, is trying to figure out how an intelligent but otherwise not super martially capable person is being useful in the battlefield. You're kind of directing your goal on helping your party in other ways. But the artifice themselves is not necessarily a, they're not a powerful wizard, they're not a heroic fighter. They're just a smart person that's made a bunch of cool stuff. Um, and I think that's kind of, I wanted to keep the inventor very focused on the cool stuff they've made. Um, and then leave what that cool stuff is very open. Oh, all right. Now, when, um, now when it came to when it came to the when it came to the plate that you had that you had mentioned, when it, whether it be, whether it be someone going with the more Iron Man approach or going with some of the more Golem approach, would are those would those um fall under these subclasses, or would that fall or that fall under a bit more of a core affair? So the, the one of the things about the inventor is that the subclasses are much more akin to almost different classes. 
Uh, the sub, the, the core class of the inventor offers very little combat capability. There's no extra attack in it. There's no. There's almost nothing in the core inventor that gives you damage. It's almost all. Um, it's almost all proficiency with you know sort of a little bit of buffs to crafting. Uh, you know, free identify spells, um, mm -hmm. things that make you a competent, smart chap, but not necessarily an adventurer. <laughs> um, the, if, if you had a subclass less inventor, they'd be much closer to an NPC than a PC, uh, which is definitely a break from how a lot of 5e is designed. But the subclasses have a much bigger weight to them because the subclass is where each of your core inventions come from. So, for example, the fantasy armor uh, or fantasy Iron Man style war plate, that's the warsmith subclass. That means at level one, you start with building yourself kind of this cool armored gauntlet that has various capabilities that give you uh, enhanced strength or the ability to shoot force blasts or things. So within, within each subclass, you still have more choices, but that subclass is your main kind of field of expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Thundersmith. You can make either a Thunder Cannon, or you can make a Hand Cannon, or you can even make a Charged Blade or Lightning Pike. Um, the weapon you start with is variable, even inside the subclass. So you have a second layer of choice there, and that's why I say that the, the subclass is almost more akin to a class, in a way, because you that's just setting your field of expertise, and then once within that, you have the normal choices you'd make. Uh, and even each subclass actually has its own upgrades. And upgrades are sort of like the closest thing in the default system would be the Warlock evocations. But rather than having class upgrades, each subclass has its own entire list of upgrades. <laughs> That's why the inventor is a much longer class than some options, just because each subclass has the sort of depth you'd expect from a class. Now, I, I want to put the caveat on that because that sometimes concerns people. And uh, I, I mean, I fully admit that the design of Inventor as how the class is structured is slightly different than how most 5B classes are structured. But the idea of how it works is that I'm giving you a toolbox to make your character, but the character that it makes then plays nicely inside of a 5E game. You have all these options in character creation that go into making sure that you feel like you're in charge of what you've made, right? Because that's the whole uh, theme of the class, is that you're making this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I really want to give them as much power to make what they want to make as possible, but then I can't let them just do everything, right? That's where something like the Unearthed Un Un Arcana Mystic went a bit astray. I want them to use the giant toolbox to make a 5e character, that from your DM's point of view will play like every other 5e character in the sense that you have cool options and specializations that you do better than anyone else, but you don't ha you aren't able to um, do everything. You have everything as the options and character creation, but then you've specialized and you specialized and now you're very good at one thing. Mm -hmm. Well, a, a, you know, a normal character is worth of things. Yeah. And that bring, that brings me to the bit to the big giant elephant in the room that's decided to break in and take a crash on my couch. <laughs> that being the crafting system. Now, crafting has been what has been one of those things that's been um, a very up and down affair over the years, where some some decide some decide to go way, very far into very far into the crunchy end of things. Some decide to go uh, go. Screw, screw it! Just just role play the whole thing, and some go a little ways in the in the middle. Um, what, where, what was your goal? What was your goal when you had when you had set up when you had finally sat down and decided that you were going to do a crafting system for Five E? What were your pillars? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. <laughs> um, so, uh, I I. Crafting was one that had its genesis very early on because as soon as the artificer, my alternate artificer, now called the inventor, I'm going to just interchangeably call it both things throughout this thing, so I apologize for that. But no worries. It's been the artificer for many years, so converting it to the inventor now is uh, take some brain power. Um, 
But as soon as that gained traction online, where you know a lot of people started using it, the natural kind of follow-up was, so this is great, where's crafting? Uh, because, you know, A, people will always associate the inventor, the artificer, with crafting, and B, the same kind of people that wanted to play an artificer or inventor uh, want crafting. Those are that's a huge overlap in that the the audience for those things. Um, and I agreed uh, in the, from the start that I would love crafting to exist. Uh, I use crafting in my games, but I always did it much more ad hoc. Um, like the players would say, I want to make a magic plus one sword, and I'd be like, well, great, these are the things you're going to need to do that, and we'll do this and that. And so I'd give them a crunchy answer to what they wanted to do, but there was minimal, you know, it wasn't really a systematic system where it was the, the, the there's always a there with me, the DM, coming up with what they would need to do to make that thing they wanted. Mm -hmm. Um so to convert that to a system that everyone could use was a very big step. And for the first couple of years of me making stuff, I bounced off making a crafting system. It was, it was too big for me to make um, just because a crafting system dwarfs even classes in scope. Um, there's just so much stuff there, uh, so much different myriad of testing. There's so many... And it's very hard to focusly play test in any meaningful way. You really need to run campaigns with it and see how they go. Uh, get to get a sense for the balance. Mm -hmm. But as my kind of audience, people following my stuff grew to much larger sizes, I began to actually have the testing resources to get feedback on a system like that. Um, and then um, as of last summer, I started working on stuff more or less full time for D&D &D Homebrew. Uh, so I had a lot more time to just throw into this system and really start grinding it out. Um, the crafting system we're going to see is about the 3.0 version. And I kind of give all this background to answer that question of what the pillars are, because the pillars have changed a little bit over time as I've kind of sussed out what works the best. Um, I started with a very crunchy system that would essentially give you the details of what everything needed to make. Um, like the specific, uh, you know, kind of specific things in the world that combined into what you wanted. But ultimately, I didn't find that, that worked super well for the majority of people using it. Um, it worked very well thematically, but it had a tendency to somewhat derail campaigns. Uh, and the example I kind of gave on this a couple of times is this is what I, this is what I did in my games? Is my players wanted to make a winged boots, which is a really cool magic item. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, sure, you can make those. And the first ingredient I gave them was one thing they needed was a rock feather, <laughs> which became a problem because now the whole campaign was about they them finding a rock feather. They wanted a rock feather more than they wanted whatever the quest was pre previous to that, <laughs> which is understandable because they wanted winged boots. Um, so what I found is that that tended to be hard for DMs to integrate their system in a way where the players had any control over the system because the players would look at it. They say, I want winged boots. Winged boots require a rock feather. Now we need to go find a rock feather. And that requires the game to have rocks in it. <laughs> that requires the game world to you know, accommodate a lot of things to make that work. So what I ended up doing was I would say that the current system is probably... Two, part, two parts crunch, one part flavor. So what I do now is I say, you need a rare primal essence or something to make winged boots. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm just kind of mm -hmm. quoting what, uh, what, what makes sense. So you need like a rare primal essence and maybe a scroll of fly and then a nice set of boots and a couple other things. So this means that when they find a rock feather, the DM can be like, yeah, that, that's an uncommon primal essence. So you'll, make, you'll, you'll tag aspects of the loot with what they count as. But it makes them much more flexible and interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So the, boot, the items you craft can be influenced by the exact nature of what you use to make them. But maybe that primal essence came from a rock. Maybe it came from a giant maybe or a dragon. Maybe it came from something entirely different that flies about. Um, but the essence of it is that the DM can now easily give loot that makes sense for the context of their encounters that are tagged with the uh, tags that the crafting system uses. So it's much easier to integrate into the game. 
Um, and that also then gives the players a great deal of flexibility. So it's not like the DM is looking up an item and giving you the materials to that item. Rather, the DM is giving you a handful of things that could be used in any number of permutations to make a large number of different things. So both makes it gives the players a lot more control over the crafting system in the sense that they are actually getting to pick what they make with the tools provided to them. And also relieves a lot of the burden from the DM of you can give them these items and know that the things that they can make with those items will be balanced against the rarity of the uh, tags you put on those items. But you don't have to worry about seeding into your adventure the things the players need specifically. Mm -hmm. and, and then the other, I guess, the, the other, sorry to go one bit go, further here, yeah, go is the it. other big aspect of it what that I wanted to change from the various existing parts of what the crafting system you'll see in the DMG is or something, is that those make an assumption about downtime that most games don't use in a modern sense. Um, and that goes into the ancient history of D&D, &D, where mm -hmm. I think it was much more common to... And this was kind of gone even by the time I started, um, where you'd go to a dungeon, and then you'd come back, and then you'd have weeks of hanging around town before you went to the next dungeon. Um, nowadays, it's much more a narratively strung along campaign, even if you are doing that kind of frontier exploring style gameplay, where you almost never have weeks of downtime. You might get a day or two. Um, and that just doesn't play nice with crafting systems that say you need 20 weeks to make something. Um, so I wanted to compress the crafting time greatly as well as integrate that somehow into your adventuring life. So one of the aspects is it often allows you to make a little bit of progress on things during long rests. It lets you to, you know... It basically works in two to four hour chunks, um, which are a lot easier to find during your adventuring day. Uh, some things still need to make be made in one shot, like potions and stuff. But those are much quicker to make. Um, but a lot of things allow you to work on them over time progressively uh, to better incorporate that into your adventuring life. Uh, all right, I can. That's. I think the only I think the only game I can th that comes to mind from recent years that delved that much into crafting was the very um, underrated fantasy craft from the from the uh, early 2010s, and that does bring me to one question, especially since one of the pillars that you have for crafting is blacksmithing, because. A problem that I have a problem that I have had with try with trying to run D and D with cert with certain um, tables because I run with a variety of tables gi given my status as a on again off again teacher is people who want to run a more low fantasy approach where magic items aren't as aren't as commonplace as they, as they might be in vanilla. Especially since for the for a lot of these people, their first introduction to fantasy was stuff like The Witcher or stuff like Game of Thrones, where the ma where magic isn't exactly plentiful. And I'm curious if through the blacksmithing s system that you have, if someone could reasonably run a uh, can a use that to aid in the campaign where magic items are are still very very limited. But st but yes. um still ha but still be comp still be competitive because you've pro you've seen it as much as I have where a lot of times at high levels people need magic items just to survive. So the the, the base answer is yes, um, but it, it's, it's somewhat more nuanced than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the blacksmithing system itself uh, provides a very extensive system for making non magical stuff. Blacksmiths themselves don't generally make magical items with this. Mm -hmm. You can make any non-magical kind of weapon, and you can even make weapons that don't exist using the blacksmithing, using my weapon template rules. Um, if you dig into 5e weapons, it's really easy to kind of decode how they work. Um, and then from there, you can make a weapon template builder that could build any possible permutation of a balanced 5e weapon. 
Um, so that that's really the core of blacksmithing is that it it but kind of focuses on that niche of um, making all the different kind of things that uh, the, the the fairly mundane kind of approach to crafting is that you can make somewhat special gear with it. And the levers for how magical that is becomes on what materials you use. So, for example, the upper ends of blacksmithing, that would start to incorporate that, that there's kind of two branches to that that are parallel paths that can somewhat merge, is that you can eventually, when you're a very uh, skilled blacksmith or you spend a lot of time on something, you can start making masterwork things, which are not quite as powerful as magic, but uh, do have some benefits to them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the power progression I tend to use in my games. I don't run a particularly low magic game, but I do run a slower power progression than I think you see sometimes where I typically will hand out masterwork weapons before I start handing out magic items. Um, though it varies greatly. Um, so it does offer a lot of that alternate kind of build path where you can make things that are cool weapons or cool unique things for your character before you plunge fully into the magic branch of it. But then you can continue from that a little bit to uh, forge actually magical stuff if your DM is giving you things like Mithril and Adamantite mm -hmm. that forge uh, more powerful weapons. Of course, those are much harder to make. And then you can merge those parallel paths once you are very high level by making a masterwork Mithril kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But since working with hard materials raises the difficulty, it's much harder to achieve masterwork with those different materials. Yep. Now, where it forges into magic would be when the blacksmith hands off the fancy weapon they've made to the enchanter. An enchanter is much more explicitly making magic stuff, but the DM still has great levers into how powerful and varied those are by what level of essences are available in that world, which is kind of the main fuel of making magic things. I talked about this a bit before. You, know, you can have arcane essences, primal essences, divine essences, that sort of thing. If the DM is only giving you common or uncommon um, kind of essences because the setting magic of the world is much more compressed, then you can still have a great flexibility when you're working with a blacksmith to make a cool lower level magic thing um, by combining your two kind of fields of expertise. Um, but that the, the levers of that are just as in the hands of the DM and setting as they would be with normal magic items. It's just the breadth of what you could get out of it is so much wider, even if it's not necessarily more powerful. Which I can definitely get behind that. Now, Given given the, given that the um, so you, we've already talked about blacksmithing and ench and enchanting. So the ne the next um, pillar when it comes to crafting that I wanted to go into is alchemy. Now, obviously, alchemy has a long illustrious history within D and D, specifically in fantasy gaming as a whole, and. And even more, even more so, with the with the fact that one of the core one of the core um, classes in Pathfinder for years has been the alchemist. What sort of approach did you want to take when it came to alchemy? So one thing to note is that alchemy, I have two approaches to. Um, in my inventor, there is something that is somewhat tongue in cheek called the potion smith, which is my version of the alchemist, and that's probably where. It overlaps maybe the most with um, the uh, Everon Artificer in theme, but it's quite a different uh, approach. And I would say people that are more familiar with the Pathfinder Alchemist will see a lot more uh, to see about that in the Inventor's Potion Smith. Um, and that is my um, weaponized version of alchemy, if you will. Mm -hmm. They throw explosive things and they buff themselves up with potions. And it's all built into the character budget of power. So you're not spending a lot of gold making your stuff. Uh, you're essentially getting it for free, but then, of course, there's anti-stockpiling features where you don't get to keep them forever. And uh, the power of them is contained to a normal player class level of power. So that's sort of my combat class approach to it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's been very well received. It's one of the more popular uh, routes for an inventor to go. 
And that just kind of shows exactly how varied the inventor can be, where you can be someone making a mechanical set of war plate, or you can be someone making potions you use to uh, support people with healing draughts or throw fire explosives, that kind of thing. Um, but then I also have a pillar of alchemy in the crafting system, which does tie into the inventor's potion smith a little bit in that they are better at making those potions to an extent, or they, they have an easier time making them. But they aren't one-to-one uh, -one tied. You don't have to be a potion smith to be an alchemist, and you don't have to be a alchemist to be a potion smith. Um, so you'll see the very class approach to it in the class solution I provide. But then you'll see the very crafting approach in the crafting solution. Um, I think alchemy is going to be one of the most popular crafting options, mm -hmm. just because it's very near and dear to adventurers' hearts. Uh, they really want their healing potions. They really want their buffs and things like that. They're all very um, useful. And they also work really well as a DM because they are consumable in nature. Um, but I also really wanted to expand what crafting alchemy can cover. I went a lot more in depth into things like oils um, that you can put on your weapons so you can get a temporarily flaming sword. Uh, a lot more in depth to kind of the various potions you can make. So it brings in all the potions in the SRD um, plus a bunch of new ones. Uh, and then it gives, it lets you make them out of reagents. And there's a lot of different ways that reagents can be gathered. But again, these are levers that are in the hands of the DM to an extent. Or to, a, you know, pretty much completely. Of how many kind of reagents you're finding. And how, well, you know, what the rarity of those are to then be converting into your potions you're making. Um... And they all focus on the basic artisan tools and crafting tools that are provided in 5e by default. For example, uh, alchemy supplies and herbalism kit, um, which have slightly different uses in the system, but some overlap as those are very related concepts. But um, so, yeah, I, I think there's two very branched approaches here mm -hmm. that kind of follow both of the, <laughs> both. I, when asked which option to go with, I, I think I took the both. <laughs> um, so you have, and those don't have the stockpiling rules, things like that. They do expire eventually, but they, you know, expire in months, usually not within your next long rest, like the class features do. Um, so it, you, you have the crafting system and then you have the class system and they're made to be able to interact, but not require one another. All right. I, I can see that. And since, since you mentioned a lot when it comes to, when it comes to, po when it comes to potions, cause that's. Uh, that's obviously the that's obviously going to be the lifeblood, pun not intended, of an adventuring party. But I'm cur I'm curious if, since al since alchemy is covered covers this in games like Pathfinder as well. Do would your alchemy system also cover things like explosives? It absolutely does, against all better judgment. Um, that's one <laughs> of those things that are already in there. Uh, so not only does it cover alchemical fire mm -hmm. it also provides my version of alchemical fire which is a bit different um and then it covers much stronger versions of alchemical fire that are scaled up to be more explosive more powerful more hideously dangerous um and then it has actual explosives um i don't tell dm what the explosives are necessarily i just call it explosive powder and that could be either more like gunpowder could be more an alchemical concoction of you know ground dragon dust or not one you know whatever you want it to be thematically i just provide a rule structure for how it works mechanically and i provide you know in the fluff i provide the various routes you could go but i try to make this very setting neutral very kind of um aesthetic neutral really of this is this should work for a lot of different kind of games um, and there's a whole list of various explosives. There's everything from a packet of blasting powder. There's smoke powder, simple explosives, powerful explosives. Um, you know, nail bombs, which are kind of like a fragmentary grenade. Um, dwarven alcohol, which is just explosive liquid. Um, you know, there's a whole range of things like that. Mm -hmm. And now I don't endorse giving those to your players because it's always it always goes poorly. But uh, should you choose to... Uh, there are certainly the routes to make that. Um, that kind of boils down to, again, you know, I was talking about the kind of essences. Alchemy works the same way, where there's genres of 
uh, reagents. You have curative reagents, reactive reagents, poisonous reagents, exotic reagents, etc. And explosives are very heavily on the reactive side of reagents. Uh, sometimes you need one curative or something for something explodes less violently. Uh, you know, something's a bit more controlled. That that thematically, that's kind of like the binding agent or something. Um, but there are always some sort of balance between those kind of pillars. Mm -hmm. And then I provide tables that are just suggestions to the DM about what those kind of reagents actually are if you want to give them the details. Like, So, for example, you can just say, you guys find a curative reagent, um, you know, exploring the forest. Or you guys can say, you find fairy steps, which are tiny white flowers in the shape of fairy wings. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these serve as a common curative reagent. Uh, so it's stuff like that where I provide gradients of detail where <laughs> you can take various different levels of uh, how uh, modeled you want this to be. Mm -hmm. And then the players, and you, you, you can then kind of define, you know, what ranges of things the players could make out of it. But at the bit core of the system, explosives are just the results of combining a bunch of reactive reagents together into something they probably shouldn't have. And part of the reason I asked this is I've, um, I know some people who have, ha who have habits of, of always liking to build traps with it, with, during, in, during encounters and build traps on the fly, because apparently they, t apparently they steal all their ideas from Wile E. Coyote, but what, given the crafting system at play, would it be possible for someone to use um, alchemy along along with uh, along with a little bit of ingenuity to create some to create some sort of explosive trap? Absolutely, and I I do so I do have uh, that in mind, and I do intentionally make that function, but I also intentionally make that uh, function to a maximum limit of how well it functions. For example. Mm -hmm. A good ex with, with the explosives, you do take increased damage from multiple charges of explosives. There's also a cap of how much damage they can do. So you're not going to one-shot the Tarask just because you get them to step on a big enough pile of explosives. But you could make a very big, fancy explosive. Um, for example, the, the, the limit of blasting powder, the most common one, would be five stacks, would get you to basically the maximum damage of a trap you could make. Um, and this can integrate well with something like the artificer, who has some of those abilities kind of built in. For example, some of the magic the art or the inventor has is the ability to leave explosive runes. Uh, they explode doing fire damage. Conveniently, fire damage sets off explosives. So you could, um, you know, leave a bunch of explosives with a fire rune and make quite a big detonation. Um, but some of them also do come with built-in fusing rules um, or other ways to set them off. The most easy way to set them off is some way of dealing fire damage to your pile of explosives. Because uh, usually fuses don't last too long beyond a couple rounds. Um, but there's a lot of different, there's a lot of routes for player creativity there, mm -hmm. as well as some safeguards against the top end of that being too effective. It should be very effective, but not always the solution to an encounter as some players will treat explosives. <laughs> well, look, a wall is just a door with a different kind of key. <laughs> well, I, as I said, I, I, I have mixed experience with giving players explosives myself that almost always goes poorly, but I encourage people to try out how it works for their groups. Although... Even if I don't, uh, I don't... I I make them sign a waiver for it. Um... <laughs> Wait, do you, do you seriously hand out a paper that's, that they have to sign no, on? The... No, <laughs> of course not. But uh, I, I just, uh, I found that giving pl explosives to players can be as hazardous to the players as to the enemies. Well, um, I don't know about you, but I see that as a, I see that as a them problem because, well, you get, well, isn't, well, this isn't, this isn't a, ho this isn't a Hollywood case. You're not going to slowly walk away from explosions. Yeah, you know, I, I the, the players have learned to be wary and I, when I ask, and how are you carrying those explosives? <laughs> are you keeping those in your bag? Ha, ha, ha. Where are those explosives when you're being fireballed? 
The on the only time I've ever had to be really careful about it is when I'm anytime I'm playing D and D when there's an engineer at the table. <laughs> well, for some people, all all problems look like a problem that needs more explosives. Well, did you, what did you have somebody kill it? Try and kill a dragon with crates of landmines or something? You know, I, I I've told this story before, but one of the earlier games I was playing of Five E, it was just the Lost Mines of Fandelver opening, mm -hmm. and I think it started with them esc escorting a cart down to Fandelver, and it's a cart full of mining tools, and they're like, "So what's in this cart?" And I'm like, "I, I don't know, um, pickaxes, you know, uh, mine reinforcement, mining explosives," and that <laughs> that, that was a, a singular point that changed the course of that campaign, because it wasn't within probably. 15 minutes of, or probably 5 minutes of that, that that cart had exploded violently as they tried to set a trap for the goblins. Um, and that mission took a rapid left turn because their delivery cart was now a crater in the road. So were a bunch of goblins, though, so <laughs> a win by their book, even if it had derailed their quest rapidly. I... Now it's a bit of a joke every time I offer explosives to them that... Uh, there's a that there's a cost in derailment of campaign. <laughs> and earlier you had you had said that your t that your take on um on 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 Al on alchemist fire and or the or the equivalent is so, is um somewhat di is somewhat different from the core. Um, could you go into that? Oh uh, yeah, sure. So I find that Alchemy Fire is something that typically players are excited to get, um, or excited to use. Um, as in, the first, as soon as they hear that Alchemy Fire exists, it's something that they want. Uh, but I, I think I find that players are often a little bit disappointed with what exists in um, 5e with Alchemy Fire, because it's very expensive. And while it does have niche use cases um they're pretty niche uh because it just it does very little damage but sets them on fire for a long time so there's cases like with a troll where it's super good but um in the mass majority of combats it's simply impractical to use so what i do with alchemy fire is i do it as a. Uh, it can deal 2d10 fire damage i believe when poured an object or you can use it as a simple ranged weapon so that's one of the big differences is it becomes a simple weapon rather than than a improvised weapon, um, and it just deals 2D fire damage on hit as it kind of explodes in a fiery rain. And then I provide a version of that that does do uh, closer to the effect of the default alchemy fire, called an alchemical napalm, mm -hmm. that has the sticky ongoing um, nature, where when you splash it all over something, it doesn't just explode into a fiery burst, but then it continues to burn them for 3d4 fire damage every turn. Um, which is, both are significantly stronger than what you'll see in Alchemy Fire. But um, it, uh, it provides more use to your investment, as it's very hard to get a situation in which your 50 gold of Alchemy Fire, and under the default rules, that's what its cost is, uh, is you know getting your money's worth out of it. I think new players often use Alchemy Fire, but veteran players often will want a case in case they fight a troll, and then almost never use it outside of that. I want these to be valuable consumable items with broad applications. Um, and then I also want them to scale up into the game. So that's common Alchemy Fire I was listing earlier, but you can get a rare item version of it that is obviously much harder to make, you know, which is styled as powerful Alchemy Fire. Mm -hmm. And that's going to do 40, 10 fire damage. Um, that's, that's a pretty big hit, uh, which will be useful all the way into, you know, pretty late into the game. Because another aspect of this, as you're using it as a simple weapon attack, which can be integrated into extra attack or anything else like that. Um, so these are always going to be good, useful items to have. Um, and there's a lot more kind of nuance to them and tools you can... Uh, tweak to what kind of uh, fire you're using for the situation you have. Uh, so just a bit more flexible and a bit more, it has a much higher limit in power um, just to keep it more relevant to the game. All right, I can, d 
it's that's definitely something I can I can see, especially given how in a lot of campaigns it seems that at higher levels items seem to matter a little bit less and less. Especially the common kind of adventuring gear. Mm -hmm. One of the goals of this is to scale up things like that to stay relevant more longer. Yeah. Where, whereas the, and given that given. Given that, I'm cur I'm curious if some if some of the items that some of this um I item expansion is al is also applicable when it comes to loot because I know some DMs who love their loot tables. So I well I currently don't have uh, loot tables for this, mm -hmm. but I am that is something that I'm going to provide in the appendixes of the version that'll be in the compendium. Um, will be how will be more guidance on how to hand this hand the hand the re, uh, reagents and uh, essences and so forth that make these, as mm -hmm. well as some of the completed items. Because I don't want to tie them all behind the crafting system, in the sense that sometimes a party with no alchemist, it would be really cool to give them alchemy fire, because that might give make them interested in alchemy in the next campaign, or even picking it up later in that campaign, mm -hmm. if they see how cool the results of that can be. So I do provide a handful of tools as is for it um, about like, you know, the prices to buy the reagents, how they can be harvested from monsters, how they can be harvested from the environment. Um, and that's a big part of how particularly alchemy works is harvesting suit from the monsters. Mm -hmm. um, as in, I, there's categories such as dragon, monstrosity, elemental, and plant and stuff. Those are all the kind of monsters you can expect to find alchemical reagents from. Mm -hmm. And there's tables for what 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 you harvest from which kind of monsters, as well as the kind of places you might gather rare reagents. In a common forest, you're going to find just common reagents, whereas when you find yourself in a boreal or something, uh, you might find more exotic things. So that kind of naturally scales a bit with the campaign. But I do intend to plan to give out more detailed loot tables like you see in the DMG in one of the appendixes. For people that prefer those more random rolling tables. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to the add-ons that you have for the compendium, there were a, there were a couple of things that I that I was curious about. Um, one of one of them is involved involving the virtual tabletop content, because yep. the two the two that you and the two that um ended up getting unlocked in that regard were Foundry and Fantasy Grounds. Yep. Um, when I had initially covered this on the Gazette show, I had operated under the assumption that it was because those those two particular resor resources when it comes to virtual tabletop were ones that you were the most familiar with. Is that the case? So not entirely. Um Essentially what happened was that I offered no virtual tabletop solutions because I'm not an expert on that field. Um, but I reached out basically to the people, to the community and said, folks, if there's people that want to help me make a virtual tabletop content version of this, um, I will work with you to, to make that something I can offer. Uh, and I also reached out to the developers to the tabletops, um, you know, the people behind them. And that's why Foundry got unlocked so much quickly, so much more quickly, because the developers behind there are very active and very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, so Foundry was very easy to find people for. Um, I have someone I'll be working with that on, and they'll be doing most of the porting work. So actually, I am probably most familiar with Foundry now. Uh, I'm the more of the I was much more on the pen and paper, pencil and paper side of this. I am a bit of a dinosaur in that regards. But with you know the way things are in the world, I had converted to uh, virtual tabletops, uh, and I actually started with Roll Twenty because uh, mm -hmm. it's just the easiest one to get into. Um, but I actually recently converted to Foundry myself uh, a few months back. So Foundry was a the easiest one to find someone to work with, as well as by far the most helpful developers, mm -hmm. um, and also the one that I was confident that if push came to shove, I could do that one. I would definitely <laughs> it would definitely take me a crash course on you know, the, the back end of it. But um, I was pretty confident in that one early on just because I had a handful of people I could work with. And uh, I, I was pretty sure I could do it in the back end, if not. Fantasy Grounds, I actually know very little about myself. I have never used it. Um, though, I, I you know, I've seen people use it. I, I know what it is. 
Um, but a very helpful person that convinced me they had the chops to do it reached out. Um, and actually, there, there's a few backups there as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was able to work out a deal with them. So and that, those are why I feel confident adding those to the already large workload is that those will be largely outsourced. Um, though I am prepared, I, I did look into them enough that I am confident I can step in to work on them if need be. Uh, and that's why the last one that's not there right now of the probably the biggest three, Roll20, is not yet there because <laughs> I have not been able to confirm that I could actually, you know, I haven't been able to find someone to do it. Mm -hmm. Or confirm that I would be able to do it if everything fell through. Because it seems like that one's a bit more complicated due, due to being a browser. Uh, distributing it is a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of people use different kind of character sheets for it that are custom, there's a bit more to know there as far as making content that universally everyone could use. Where Fantasy Grounds and Foundry have got a good grasp on how things plug into them. Um, as well as pe people that are willing to be my expert on that. And in this case, do most of the work. All right, I got gotcha. you. And when it obviously when it comes to the stretch goals, I did want to congratulate you on managing to get all the way up to the crazy town tier of it. <laughs> that was that was my backstop, and people just sailed right right through it. <laughs> yep. Uh, it's it's you know the 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 ones that I had the ones up to thirty k mm -hmm. are the ones that I had planned for the campaign. Mm -hmm. As in, I wasn't even really... Sh 10k was a literal goal. Uh, yeah. I don't think that everyone grasped that I wasn't aiming for a funded in three hours uh, goal. I, that, that's that's what I thought, okay, that's what I can make this book for. And people had given me estimates that I'd make between, you know, 5 to 50k, a huge range there. And I thought, well, um, it'll be unfortunate if I don't hit the goal, but I'd rather not hit the goal and be able to deliver the content if I do then you know be at any risk for that so i set the goal at 10k and said well here we go um and it hit that in three hours uh so then i rapidly started slamming up the stretch goals and uh we blew through those in the first day i think uh, mm -hmm. i guess the second day was by the time we hit the 30k one mm -hmm. um and then you know there's a lot of temptation to start just throwing more stretch goals up yeah but uh, that's where i had to kind of balance reevaluate uh give some consideration to this you know and i started talking to folks about what would be those stretch goals and as i kind of talked to them more i realized that what i wanted to do more than add a bunch of new stretch goals of content like that was to expand everything more so there are some new stretch goals that are content uh there's some new stretch goals that are add-ons and then um what I really want to do was just offer to make more of everything uh, rather than try to uh, add more commitments, just add the commitment that everything would be the best I can make it. Um, and at that phase of stretch, I put up phase two, which kind of summarized that. Um, added one more physical content reward, which are by far the most challenging to fulfill logistically. And then the ADK one was... At that point, what I thought was the pie in the sky, uh, just because that one's kind of uh, one for the folks that follow my stuff for a long time. That's something I get asked a lot, like if I can write up, you know, optimization and detailed guides with my own mm -hmm. content, because a lot of folks really enjoy reading through that sort of thing um, and just getting that perspective on it. So I thought, OK, well, that, that would be kind of a fun top end stretch goal. But then I thought about it, and I'm like, well, so if if this does keep going, what else can I throw up there? And the, the, the first one there I came up with was, you know, I my the amount it costs me to make a book goes down the more people to order the book, and it goes up the more pages I add. So making the 300-page one was just me giving back that volume discount um, because I want to give people as much content as possible. And then the digital tool set for crafting is the real pie in the sky of something that I actually started making. Uh, my background is, is in somewhat in software development. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I came from uh, video game software development previously, working for publishers, and then um, corporate software development on web stuff. So that's something I do have the, the, the technical skills to do if need be, though it's something I will probably to some degree outsource. Um, but I actually, so, so that, that I started on that when I first started the crafting system, cause I thought that would be really, 
cool to have because uh, I don't love the idea of looking up everything on tables. It'd be really cool, mm -hmm. in my opinion, if you just type in plus one longsword, it auto completes, gives you the gives you the reagents, that sort of thing. So that's something I knew I wanted, but when I started on it, I worked on it for about four days, and I'm like, well, this is way too much work to do for something that no one's paying me for. Uh, so <laughs> then I kind of let it fall to the side. But if uh, if I'm going to be going full time on making 5e content, well, that's back on the menu. So either Either it'll be something I, you know, work with someone on or do myself. That's still being finalized as to what the breakdown there will be. Mm -hmm. But it's something I'm confident I can do now, now that my future looks very, uh, very 5e homebrew for at least many months. Yeah. And it's, de it's, um, it's definitely, it's definitely something that I'm going to be looking forward to because, Something I've noticed a bit of a I've noticed a bit of a pattern when it comes to the third party five e five e material that um that I that I've covered and that I've seen that I've seen coming out, which is pe which is people want more and more want as again with that whole passage of time thing you mentioned, people more and more wanting to expand the sa expand the um, sandbox in one way or another. I suppose the I suppose the ultimate case in point with that kind of thing is the level up project that EN World is doing right now. <clears throat> but the cra the crafting thing is the thing that I th I think is going to get a whole lot of use and a whole lot of abuse. Yeah, so the crafting is probably is definitely the most recent part of this and the reason mm -hmm. it's in the book is because it's uh, has become very popular. Um, I mean, even as I started po posting the first kind of beta versions, they became almost instantly somewhat widespread. Um, and so I knew that if I'm doing a book, that, that's going to be in it. Um, and I think that's one of the main draws of this. And to be honest, I, I have a tier where I offer just the crafting system as a standalone soft cover book. And I thought that was going to be... <laughs> <laughs> really popular. Mm -hmm. I, I've been a little bit surprised as how many people want everything um, as opposed to just the crafting system. Um, but I'm also glad that people want more to buy into more of the system. But I, I've been kind of uh, from the start knowing that crafting is a standalone system that I want to integrate with the rest of my stuff, but not depend on the rest of my stuff. Um, and that, that, that's kind of a goal of mine to keep that to be true. That uh, the crafting system is kind of one of my big pillars, but I also don't want... I want to limit to some... I want to have interactions between all the content I make, but I don't want things to be interdependent where I don't need to. Because I want people to feel like they can take this crafting system and plug it into any kind of um, 5e homebrew system they're using. Um, and if I can provide things like uh, the crafting cards and the digital tool set for it, that'll make it really easy to integrate into a lot of systems. Um, just because it makes crafting easier and easier to use, which I think is probably one of the big hurdles. I think crafting is something that not everyone wants, but a, a huge segment of the player base does want to do crafting it's just one of the trickier things to uh set up in a way that a dm can have confidence in and that it won't uh make their game become a magic item zoo real quickly mm -hmm. um and also it's a scary amount of complication um as i said when i when i set out to make it uh, my first conclusion was that it was too big for one person to make, and I think a lot of DMs have bumped into that syst that thing, where they've sunk a huge amount of time into making a system, and found that it's a void that can keep eating time forever. So if I can offer a system that's much easier to use and adapt, mm -hmm. uh, I think that'll be a big, a big win as well as just really useful for a lot of people. And I will definitely be looking f be looking forward to how it de how it develops with time. Especially, especially with the um, other things that are getting added to the proverbial pot in this case. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come all the way up to the uh, temple. 
Uh, thank you for having me. I love the chance to talk about all this, and if you had a lot of great questions here, I'm, I'm glad that I could get all this information out onto the internet mm -hmm. so people can make a hopefully more informed decision about what they want to use. Yep. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I know what I'll be doing next. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>